As training camp opens for the Wolverines, some burning questions need answers. We'll discuss next on Michigan Podcast. But there's going to be one team that's going to play solely as a team. No man is more important than the team. No coach is more important than the team. The team, the team, the team. Looks deep for Anthony Clark. Waits for it. Nip Clark. This is no time for that. In the pocket and a sack. Tim Jamison. Brady gets terrific. Throws it and a touchdown night again. Schultz just before Brazil got it. And a leaping interception by Woodson. Harbaugh back to throw over the middle. Caught by Collins at the five on his feet. Touchdown, Michigan. He's 5'7", 179 pounds, a junior at Michigan. But Jamie Morris packs a wallop, and he delivers for Bo Schindler. And here's your first play. Pressure coming, sack. It is Glenn Steele, number 81, who fought his way through the traffic. Option. And Robinson calls his own number, and he's going to score. Oh, an easy touchdown for Ron Robinson and Michigan. The MVP in today's ball game. Oh, you want to know who it is? I'm standing alongside his proud daddy. The quarterback, Brian Greasy of Michigan. Go Blue, and welcome to this week's episode of Michigan Podcast. I am Steve Dace, and thank you so much for helping us to spread the word about what we're doing here on Michigan Podcast. Please subscribe to our channel here on YouTube. If you like what we do, share that link with every other Michigan fan you know. And, you know, we get a lot of people that follow other college football teams that watch us each week and comment as well. We love you, too, because we try to take a big-picture view of college sports, albeit with some maize and blue-tinted glasses but we try to take a wide-angle look at what's going on in college football and college basketball. So please, you can subscribe as well. Click like on our videos. Help us get the word out. Also, follow us on Twitter at Michigan Podcast. Get the audio version of this show each week via iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play as well. Coming up on this week's episode, one of the all-time Wolverine greats, Jamie Morris, who left school as Michigan's all-time leading rusher before Anthony Thomas and Mike Hart came along. He's going to join us a little bit later on because he played with Jim Harbaugh as his quarterback and now knows him as our head football coach. So he's got a unique perspective. We're looking forward to talking to Jamie Morris a little bit later on. But first... We mentioned training camp has officially opened for the 2017 Wolverines, which means it is now time to finally get answers to some burning questions. Here are what we believe on Michigan Podcast are the top five questions that need answered the next month before we face Florida on September the 2nd. Let's begin. Number five, is last year's depth ready to be this year's stars see where i think a lot of the college football intelligentsia and this is something if you're a frequent viewer or listener to michigan podcast you've heard me uh deconstruct this already this whole you know these talking points we have every off season well one of them is well you know michigan lost 17 starters well they've only got five returning starters back and you know, Michael Spath, uh, who does uh, work for WTKA and Michigan Insider, took a look at that number and found with some of his excellent research that actually nine other Michigan players started last year. And I broke that down what that means last week. I mean, would you rather have a guy like Josh Metellus, who started and played in the Orange Bowl as his one start, or a guy who started every game for, you know, um, Illinois? What would you rather have? Well, yeah. I mean, me too. I think that's pretty obvious. So you can yank, chuck that talking point out the window. It doesn't mean much. But 
That doesn't mean we're slappies here and we're ignorant to reality at the same time. The issue that Michigan, Michigan is going to have an issue with depth. I don't think there's any question about that. And, and while we don't like it when people use intellectually dishonest or uh, intellectually inconsist, inconsistent reasoning to poke holes at our favorite team, you know, we can't, you know, return fake news for fake news here. You've got to analyze your own team the way you'd analyze somebody else's, right? So let's not pretend that losing all of those guys, we're going to have 19 players. We have 19 players right now. Uh, that with NFL training camps are now open. We've got 19 guys that played for our team last year are now sitting in NFL training camps. You don't just instantly replace those guys, okay? It just doesn't work that way, right? But the criticism is wrong. Rashawn Gary and Maurice Hurst, they're going to be okay. I think they got this. Chris Evans, I think he's all right, man. I think he's going to make this whole football thing going to work out for him. Tyrone Wheatley Jr., yeah. I think he's going to be okay. I think I think a tight end, he'll be all right. You know, I think kid's got a got a future. Devin Bush, Tyree Cannell, yeah, you know, I think, yeah, not bad. Those guys are going to be fine as new starters. The question with our youth is the depth behind them. Because last year, we had so much depth, we were rolling hockey lines out there. All right, so last year when Taco Charlton goes down for a third of the season, you just throw Chase Winovich and Rashawn Gary in there, and you don't miss a beat, and the guy's a first-round pick that you're replacing in April's NFL draft. Now the question becomes, and this is where you need a more nuanced perspective. You need to know more than just I'm some national media guy, so let me get a few talking points together on all the big-name teams so when I go on a local radio show, it sounds like I know what the hell I'm talking about. That's what too many of these guys do, frankly. This is where you got to do a little bit co- thing called research, a little bit of, you know, work, okay? And what I am concerned about is the depth because it may turn out guys like James Hudson and Donovan Jeter and Carlos Kemp are tremendous depth guys, but we don't know that yet. And so you can't count on Rashawn Gary and Chase Winovich and Mo Hurst and Brian Monet, who's had a bit of an injury history at Michigan. You, that's an outstanding starting defensive line. I'd go to war every Saturday with that group. I don't know that there's another team in college football that we can say right now for sure is better than that quartet. But it's 12 weeks, a lot of snaps. Guys get hurt. Guys get banged up. What comes in after those guys? That's the question that needs to be answered the next month of camp. The depth. The youth and the returning starter stat is way overrated. It's a lazy talking point. But youth will be felt in the depth because we can't count on those guys being there for every single meaningful snap. The next question that must be answered here in training camp. Who becomes the playmakers, the go-to guys on offense? We have a lot of talented prospects, okay? Like, we know Chris Evans is an explosive player. We know he can exploit a crease against Hawaii as a situational player. We know he can come off the bench with fresh legs in the Orange Bowl against a tired but really salty Florida State defense and light them up in the fourth quarter. We know that. But here's what we don't know yet. What we don't know is if we need him to be a guy that totes the rock either out of the backfield or or catching the ball 20 times a game. And he becomes the focal point of the other team's defensive strategy. Can he still average six yards a pop? Actually, it was seven yards a pop last year. That is what we don't know. Like, we know... Donovan Peoples-Jones looks like a fifth-year senior, let alone a kid who just enrolled in January. But what we don't know is, can he make that big catch that we saw Amaro Darbo make? Or we saw Jehu Chesson make several times his junior year. Let's face it, his senior year was a disappointment. That's what we don't know. We know we have plenty of talented guys. But do we have the guys that can be the guy when they're the main guy? That's one of the questions that has to be answered in training camp. But really, you kind of don't know that one 
until we get to the games. I mean, there isn't a coach in America, except for maybe Tuscaloosa, Alabama, who's going to do a better job of putting pressurized game situations on his players this month of August than our guy, Jim Harbaugh. But there's only so many things that you can emulate at a practice. It's just not the same as doing it in front of 100,000 people at Jerry World and 10 million more are watching at home. And that's what we don't know yet. Question number three, the third most important question that has to be answered here during camp. Who, are, who exactly are these new guys in the secondary? There you see Jordan Lewis making, that's not even all American play, man. That's like an all universe play to win the game against Wisconsin. Lavert Hill, David Long, Josh Metalis, Tyree Cannell, Benjamin St. Just, Brad Hawkins. Boy, these are guys, if, you, if you've watched their recruiting tape or you saw them in the spring, you didn't see much of Long and Hill in the spring. They were banged up, but they look like they're ready to go. But again, not the same as doing it in game action. Now, a lot of you have asked me, Steve, is it easier to get guys ready to play man where it's just your best versus my best than it is against uh, than it is when they're playing a lot of zone and they've got to read coverages and a lot of communication? Well, those of us out here in the cheap seats, that makes sense. But if you know Don Brown's defense, it's a little bit more complicated than that. And a lot of hidden looks, a lot of masked looks and. I, I'm that is the unit I am the most concerned about on this team, other than one we're going to talk about here in just a few minutes. The next question Will the offensive line stop holding this program back? There you see the play that essentially cost Michigan a spot in the playoffs. Jaleel Johnson's safety against the Wolverines. Watch Michigan's offensive line get blown up, miss an assignment on a stunt. You see, Johnson just comes clean. Lack of communication in a, ter- in a terrific atmosphere at Kinnick Stadium sh- against the shadow of their own goal line. They get fooled on a stunt, and then they get blown up. The guys who actually put a hat on a hat get blown up, and there you go. That safety ended up being the margin of victory that cost Michigan in that game last year. And it's ironic. I mean, this program, if you really look at the what I would call the Bo era, essentially Bo arriving in 1969 through his two – uh, top uh, two of his top assistants in Gary Moeller and Lloyd Carr succeeding him. The staple position for Michigan, the position that established the program, and, and over that time we had some great running backs. We sort of became a wide receiver U with a lot of guys that became All-Americans or played in the NFL. We had a lot of guys, we went through a stretch where a lot of our guys played in the NFL at quarterback. You know, there's a famous story that Bo used to tell. He was at Rick Meyer's house. You remember him, the old Notre Dame quarterback who was the number two pick in the NFL draft back in the day. He was at Rick Meyer's house both of, in Goshen, Indiana. Both of Rick Meyer's parents were Michigan grads. And he's, he's doing a visit at Rick Meyer's house, and they're getting ready to watch a Monday night football game with Jim Harbaugh starting for the Bears. And Dan Deerdorf, Bo's old lineman, is doing color for the game. And Bo's like, dude, this is harmonic convergence. This could not go better. I got a Michigan quarterback and a Michigan guy doing the call on Monday night football when I'm trying to sign arguably the top high school quarterback in the country, Okay. And Deerdorf opens the show by saying, in the entire history of the NFL, there's been like 18,000 touchdown passes thrown up until this point, and none of them have been thrown by a Michigan quarterback. And Bo tells the story about how he had to quickly pivot on his feet, and he turned to Rick Meyer and said, but you, young man, you could be the first. Uh, Yeah, Rick Meyer went to Notre Dame. (laughs) Although Elvis Gerbach wasn't too bad. We got him instead. But the point being, since that era, going back to when Harbaugh was a first-round pick for the Bears, we went through pretty consistently our quarterbacks playing in the pros. So we've had some great players at other more notable positions, but really the position that was the foundation of the Michigan program going back to the Bo era was the offensive line. And that is the position with a couple of exceptions. Uh, The year that we had Denard Robinson and uh, Fitzgerald Toussaint both rushed for 1,000 yards. With a couple of exceptions, since the end of the Bo era, which I would say ended with the retirement of Lloyd Carr 10 years ago, 
that position group has held this program back more than any other. And yes, we've got 19 guys playing in the NFL, uh, or 19 guys in NFL camps. We had the most guys drafted in college football last April, but did you see the one position we had nobody drafted? Yeah. None of our offensive linemen were drafted. So that's the position that has the last step, I think, of this program's evolution at stake. The, we go from the program's back on track, we're, we're nationally relevant again, we're a periphery or in the top 10 as a program, we're playing in major bowl games, but if we want to be a national championship playoff contender, that's the position that needs to come correct. And that's, I think, the second biggest question to be watching during training camp here for the next four weeks, which brings us to what I think is the biggest question of them all. Is there really, and I mean really, a quarterback competition? There you see John O'Corn, some film from his one start last year against Indiana, which didn't inspire a lot of confidence, even though at this time last year, all of us pretty much thought he was going to be the starting quarterback heading into camp a year ago. Here we're watching Brandon Peters, who I wouldn't say he lit up the spring game, but he clearly played better than Wilton Spate did. Well, word from the Rome spring practices is John O'Corn uh, really came on throughout the offseason. Brandon Peters has really emerged. Jim Harbaugh said last week, you'll recall, that uh, at the Big Ten media days, they essentially have a three-way tie for first on the depth chart. Is that really true? Or... Is this an attempt to light a fire under Wilton Spate to remind him, hey, it's still a meritocracy here and your performance in front of 60,000 Michigan fans in that spring game didn't exactly you know, instill a lot of confidence? I think the reason why that's the biggest question is the most important spot on the team. Now, I, got, I believe this. I'm not sure Wilton Spate's ceiling is that much higher than what we've already seen. But I also think when your opening opponent is Florida and the next six games you're playing, you probably are going to be a double-digit favorite in all of those. And Florida's breaking in a new quarterback too. I've got to believe Brandon Peters and or John O'Corn. I mean, if this is Wilton Spate, they can't even be here. They got to be a lot better because the experience factor at that position, if you get by that game against Florida, which I think is going to be a relatively low-scoring slugfest, probably 21, 24 points wins that game. If you get by that game, then you've got some margin to experiment a little bit and see if the other guys on that on that 2D, particularly Brandon Peters, if their higher ceilings can be realized this year. And it's worth making that Alex Smith, Colin Kaepernick switch that Coach Harbaugh made with the 49ers and it took him to a Super Bowl. But that opening game, and given what's at stake, who the opponent is, their quarterback situation as well, I've got to believe that unless if, if Wilton Spate still has full motor function, If he's just not out there, just literally urinating all over himself, I've got to believe he's going to start that game against Florida. Because again, if you squeak by that, you're now looking at maybe being 7-0 and going into Penn State at the end of the year. And that gives you a lot more time during meaningful game action to see really who is the quarterback that gives you the best chance to win in Happy Valley and beat Ohio State at the end of the year. So what do you think are the big questions that you're looking forward to uh, seeing some answers to during training camp, or at least pretending we get answers because you know Coach Harbaugh loves going to that submarine? Let us know. Find us online at michiganpodcast.com. Tweet to us at Michigan Podcast. A win would really satisfy the alumni here, wouldn't it? For a week. Second down, 10, Callaway in motion, Brown back, stepping up in the pocket, unloading down the far side and up in the end zone, it is caught for the touchdown by Colazar. Oh my God. Back here on Michigan Podcast, and we are honored to be joined on this week's episode by one of the all-time Wolverine greats. Former running back Jamie Morris joins us now. He also does the afternoon drive show there on WTKA in Ann Arbor. So he's around the team and covering the team year-round. And, Jamie, it is an honor to have you with us here on Michigan Podcast. Thanks for joining us. No problem. Thank you for having me. So when you watch your former teammate, right, you know, the, the guy that 
used to roll with back in the day, the guy that used to call plays in the huddle, the guy that used to hide from the wrath of Shem Beckler, just like the rest of you did back in those days. As you watch him now steer the good ship, Mason Blue, that he's the captain, that he dominates headlines year round, even when the team isn't playing. He's the lead story on SportsCenter plenty of nights in the offseason. As you watch all of this go down, Jamie, is it still kind of surreal to you to be watching this or – is, are you kind of just settled in now that he's just the football coach? No, I'm settled in now. It's been it's been two years. We're starting our third season, so yeah, I'm 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 used to it now. Reality has hit, and I'm just I'm glad he's doing what he he's doing. And uh, you know, we always thought he would be a great coach, and he would be a great coach at Michigan. So it's it worked out well for us. Watching the way he has taken a program that had fallen on hard times, had averaged barely seven wins uh, for the decade prior to his arrival, the way he has instantly not just revitalized the program, but really changed the national perception of the brand. Has this gone even better than you had anticipated or hoped, or as somebody that's known and played with him for so many years, are you not surprised by this, Jamie? I'm really not surprised about this. I mean, yeah, we, fought, we, we, we had fallen on some hard times. Uh, being here at Michigan, but um, the one guy that could really turn things around was Jim Harbaugh, and you know Jim came here, and I knew he would uh, make a big change. I didn't expect a ten and three season in the first year. Um, this past season, a little bit of disappointment, but you know what? Uh, with disappointment comes great, great strides for the following year, and you know this is probably what this team needs. For this year. You mentioned earlier you guys suspected back in the day when you were playing together that he might make a great coach. Tell us why. Can you give us a, a, a personal anecdote or two or a specific moment that, that you had with him as your quarterback, as, your, as, as the team leader that you thought, you know what, I think this guy could be a leader of men on the sidelines in the future. Well, just judging on how he commanded the huddle. You know, just judging. And Jim knew where everybody was supposed to be. So any player who didn't know their assignments could turn to Jim and he would tell them where they need to be and what what, what they should expect on what was going to happen. So he was that type of coach. I mean, excuse me, that type of player. And um, just sometimes, when you know, you could see him when we walk up to the line of scrimmage, he would always, he would always yell, check, 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 check. That means we, we may be out of him, boys. So that's the kind of player he was. How much of the influence of the Bo era when you guys played do you see in how Jim coaches now? And then how much do you see where this is his own style at the same time? Well, I see a little bit of Bo in him. I see Mike, I see Mike Ditka in him. I see Ted Marchabroda in him. I see, uh, I see his father in him, but I do see a little bow in him, and you know you can see some of his sayings because those are the same sayings that Bo said. So you can see his attitude, but it, he's making it his own. So these kids don't know that they they know of Bo Schembechler, but they wouldn't know unless I said that's what Bo did to us. You know, when we compare notes, when I talk to the young people, that's how we know. Go back two and a half years ago when Michigan has an opening and his name's being bandied about, but he still has a job with the 49ers. How confident were you that this was going to have the happy ending at that time Michigan fans were looking for? Um, I was probably 80% confident that we had a shot, that, you know, I knew that, you know, if the job was open – and if it was the if the you know all the planets lined up, and he had an opportunity to come here, he'd come here. Former Michigan great Jamie Morris is here with us on this week's episode of Michigan Podcast. Now I got to ask you because I get a chance here on Michigan Podcast or, or doing fill in work on Sirius XM to talk to people looking at our team here, Jamie, from a more national perspective, a broader perspective. And it's interesting to get their feedback on the progress of the program, on Coach in particular. I want to get your reaction to some of the things that I hear, one of which is 
when Jim first took over, I remember watching that uh, first Thursday night game against Utah, and the entire Fox team was on there. Dave Wanstat, Matt Leinert, Colin Cowherd saying it's going to take you know Michigan three to four years to be nationally relevant. And the end of the year, I think ranked twelfth in the country in ten and three. Right. And so he, he accelerated this program early on beyond what most people thought was capable. And now I'm sure you hear this, too. The narrative is, well, he hasn't beaten anybody. Well, they finished third in the division two years in a row. He's overrated. So the same media that essentially wanted to follow him to the urinal uh, and make that the lead story on SportsCenter every night. Now they are complaining he's overexposed and isn't really that good of a head coach. How do you react to sort of those changing media narratives? Or are you like, you know what, we got the coach we wanted. We don't even really care. You know what? I, I it, it used to really make me mad about these guys because you know these guys have been in those situations. Matt Leinart as a player, they want that as a player and a coach. So for those guys to say that, that's just a little bit of hate, a little bit of jealousy that they have. But that's okay. I mean, that's that's why they get paid to say what they need to say. But that being said, we got the right coach. This guy's gonna turn gonna turn it around. It may not be at the timetable that everybody else wants him to get it done, but he's done all the right things if you think about it. Uh, a team that went five and seven the year before he got here, and he took them ten and three. That that that's a that's a success story. Uh, last year, this team, a lot of people picked this team to go to the um, final four. Uh, if some things would have went went our way, it could have happened for us. We, were un- we, we had some misfortunate things to happen. We had a letdown in, in one game. Um, and you know what? We didn't get some calls, but you know what? We play above that. We just didn't get it done in, in Columbus. So that being said, you take, you take your lumps, you move on, and that's what Jim has done. He's going to move on. And, yes, this year he's got a young team, but he's got a young, uh, talented team. And you can get experience each and every game. So I think he'll gain experience each and every game. And, uh, you know, something good could happen this season too. So there's a lot of players that got, there's a lot of young players that got a lot of time to play last year. And they got, they got a chance to see what it's like to play Michigan football, the Jim Harbaugh way. So that being said, there's some things that can happen our way. It's, Hey, you make luck go your way too. So I got to ask this too, Jamie, because I'm sure you've heard this as well. And you're a talk show host, so you get the you know provocative opinions and hot takes to get thrown out there. I get asked a lot from people around the country, how much of this is Jim's personality? How much of this is contrived to, in a Belichickian way, take the pressure off the players and put it on him? How much of this is to build a brand, to get Michigan out there, to create viral social media buzz, which obviously is beneficial in recruiting? You know, I've never even met him. You played for him, so you're far more qualified to answer this than I could from 10,000 feet away. So how much of this, what we see, like showing up at Big Ten Media Days last week, dressed like he's ready to go coach a game, how much of this is he's just a fun-loving guy that marches by the beat of his own drummer? How much of this is dude knows how to play the media game? I think it's a combination of everything, but this is Jim Harbaugh. Look, Jim Harbaugh was ready to he was ready to he was ready to coach a team. I mean, he's ready when you when you call media day first day of media day, that's game day for Jim. And he wore his game day attire. I mean, he's relaxed, he's ready to go. I mean, he was very open to the media. He didn't turn anybody down. He he was able to be himself. I think a lot of a lot of people were appalled by it. That's too that's too bad. Maybe they don't understand Jim Harbaugh. He wasn't trying to knock anybody. He wasn't trying to hurt anybody. He wasn't trying to say I'm you know this is my stick. Jim Harbaugh is going to be he's he's a real guy, and that's what he's going to do. He's going to be Jim Harbaugh. How confident are you, Jamie, he can develop all of these young players on the fly, reload instead of rebuild? And and the returning starter number is misleading. I mean, everybody keeps saying, well, they lost 17 starters. Well, and they only have five returning, but they actually have nine other guys that started at least one game. And as I pointed out 
in in last week's Michigan podcast. I mean, w- would you rather have a, you know a guy who's a three year starter at Maryland and and started every game and he gets counted as a returning starter, or would you rather have Maurice Hurst and Rashawn Gary back? Yeah, me too. I think that's pretty obvious, right? So, how much of this though can they develop a lot of these guys to play major minutes, to be team leaders, to be the guys that don't wait for Amara Darbo to make that catch, but now Tariq Black and Donovan Peoples Jones are the guys that have to make those catches. Can that really happen all at once for a young team in the course of a season, Jamie Morris? Well, he's got the right players. Let's just say he didn't he didn't just go get Joe Joe uh, Joe Schmo from the uh, from the Apple Orchard. He went and got some five five and four star players that are ready to make make plays on a um, on a high, on a college football field, and they want to play now. So he's given every guy an opportunity. Um, many people don't get this opportunity. So you got to take advantage of your opportunities. Uh, that being said, Jim knows how to coach him up and get him there. Uh, he's got a fine coaching staff. I think they know what they need to do. I think everybody, I think everybody's excited for this season. So it's a reload. I think it's an early reload, but it's a reload. I mean, you, you, you he's got the talent. And a lot of kids, you're gonna you're gonna have to uh, get the talent out of them early, and uh, they got some uh, they got some horses out there, and you got to feel pretty good about it too. Is there a player out there that you know because you've been able to be around the team um, that maybe some of the rest of us around the country have not that you're like, hey, watch this guy. I think he's gonna flash this fall. I mean, I, I tell you to watch the receiving core and watch defensive backs. Because those are the youngest guys that are going to be on that field. We have a, we're loaded at the running back spot from an o- offensive line standpoint. I think you're going to see a young offensive line, but far better, far better athletic than you saw last year. Uh, and they'll gel together. And they've been doing a lot of off-season uh, player, player player meetings. And I think you, that you, that'll do wonders for them. I think um, quarterback. Well, hey. It'll settle itself. I mean, the incumbent in uh, Wilton State is awesome. I think the emergence of Brandon Peters has been awesome. Hey, it's a meritocracy. You want it, go get it. Uh, I think from the uh, linebacker spot, Mike McCray, he's done a great job, and he'll lead those linebackers. Like you said, the defensive line, I mean, it's really ridiculous. Everybody's saying that only one person returning from the defense. You've had a lot of guys that have got it got a lot of opportunities to play they just get a chance to play a full season now on the field so um we we're not as deep as we were last year but maybe these guys can play you know that's the most important thing these guys are going to go out and give everything they have last question for you jamie morris so during the off season i console myself because i just can't wait every year for the most wonderful time of the year college football season i watch a lot of the old games on youtube uh, and I used to collect them, but they're all on YouTube now, including like the actual broadcast. So it's really cool. I just went through the entire 1985 college football season, a season which, of course, you know very well. Uh, Michigan was coming off a six and six year. People were riding the game had passed bow by, and uh, the schedule was too tough. Notre Dame to open with, which was nationally ranked, and uh, Maryland, which was Sport Magazine's number one team in the country, on the road at South Carolina, who was in the top ten. They all said you guys were doomed, and that went on to be, I'm sure, one of Coach Schembechler's favorite teams. You finished number two in the nation. Are there some parallels there for being discounted nationally, for having your coach's credentials suddenly questioned? Are there some parallels between that 1985 team, do you think, and maybe this year's Michigan squad? Not to put any pressure on this team, but you make a perfect uh, um, analogy. This team is not – not many people are – they're not counting on this Michigan team. They're thinking this Michigan team is too young and that it will not, it doesn't have the uh, right players. And there's a lot to prove from these players. A lot of these players know that. Um, So that being said, they may surprise a lot of people coming into this season. Uh, A lot of people know the Jim Harbaugh, the coaching of Jim Harbaugh, but they have about to find out the real coaching of Jim Harbaugh, because this is a team that I think if they're pointed in the right direction, you can't stop them. Jamie Morris, one of the all-time greats in the maize and blue. It's been an honor having you on the show, brother. We'd love to do it again sometime. Thank you very much. No.
Thank you. I really appreciate it. All right, take care. Go Blue. Go Blue. Came with the blitz. You gotta believe that they're gonna be aggressive. Jones is coming again. Sterner gets it away this time. Through the hand of the receiver and intercepted. Whitley with the pick. He's taking it to the house. James Whitley goes all the way back. And this game is over. Sterner did a great job delivering this ball where he had to, and it went right through the hands of Smith. Something that Smith, who's just a junior now, will live with that all year in the offseason as he prepares. And Houston Nutt says, are you kidding me? This week's Twitter poll, by the way, this was the most voted on Twitter poll we've had yet. So thank you for those of you following us at Michigan Podcast on Twitter. But we asked you, heading into training camp, what's your biggest concern with the Michigan football team? And wow, look at those answers. We gave you those four options. And it's almost 25% across the board, a split between the overall youth, the quarterback position, the offensive line, and the secondary. So I don't think I've ever seen that before. Uh, I mean, 25, 25, 25, 25. I think that just goes to show we all agree those are the four biggest unknowns, although quarterback is a known. What we don't know, though, is if what we saw from Wilton Spate in the spring was, uh, uh, you know, the football equivalent of a bad hair day or if it's time to light our hair on fire. That's the part we don't know. But the offensive line, as I mentioned earlier, this has been the position group that has held this program back more than any other. And there's so many new names in the secondary, so many new names with depth that, yeah, that's where you see the impact of the overall youth. That brings us to this week's viewer or listener question of the week. Nate in Iowa says, I'm not convinced Harbaugh is a great coach. What are your thoughts? I'm going to try and handle this professionally. And and let me stipulate this, okay? Pardon me. I, I get it if you don't like him. I get it. Can we keep it real here? You know, just a few of us hanging out here on YouTube or on iTunes. If I were a fan of another school and another school's coach was getting this much run, even when games aren't being played, I'd be sick of it too. Okay? So I I don't begrudge you for having Harbaugh fatigue if you're not a Michigan fan. I don't. I get it. I would too. Most of us around the country have Alabama fatigue. You know, I find myself torn. I I'm, I just love watching excellence. At the other, on the other hand, I'm kind of sick of watching it. <laughs> All right, so I get it. Okay, I have a love hate relationship with Urban Meyer. I mean, I love to hate him because I I think he's a tremendous coach. I have a huge admiration for his resume. On the other hand, I wish he'd stop building it at my favorite team's expense. <laughs> All right, so I get this. I get the fact you don't want to turn into sports, tune into Sports Center. Does anybody still watch that, by the way? You don't want to tune into ESPN uh, in the dead of April and watch, you know, Harbaugh giving cleats to the Pope. Especially if you're in Oklahoma winning multiple conference championships, in Alabama winning multiple national championships, a Clemson going to back to back championship games. I get it. If you're a fan of those kinds of schools, you're like, come on, man. This is a carnival show. I understand that. And if it was on the other foot, this shoe, I might be saying the same thing myself. But do not conflate your your justifiable, even though I don't agree with that because I'm a Michigan fan. Harbaugh was my favorite player growing up. When I used to create myself as a kid, well, I did that well in my adult years, let's not lie. When I used to create myself on NCAA football, I gave myself number four, no matter what position I put myself at. Okay, so I'm a slap. I'm going to own that now. I'll live up to it. I am going to brand myself right here. I will own this, Poop. I'm a Jimmy Slap, okay? But there's some justifiable reasons to think if you're not a Michigan fan, he's overexposed. But do not conflate your frustration with his potential overexposure with the fact the dude knows how to coach football. First of all, he's got a top five winning percentage all time in the National Football League, like the highest level of the sport, guys. Top five all time. So do I need to continue? I think that pretty much settles it. Oh, how, how about this one? Stanford's program had the longest bowl drought 
in college football when he took it over. His first year, they were a 40-point underdog to number one USC, and he beat them. By the time he left, he built them into a top-five program in the country. Took Andrew Luck, who was considered, you know, a mild four-star prospect, but was not one of the top five or six high school quarterbacks in the country, and developed him into the number one overall pick in the NFL draft. Should I continue? How about Michigan? Five wins before he arrived, ten wins the year that he arrived, and hey, Nate, you live in Iowa. How about the fact the quarterback he won those ten games with his first year was Jake Rudock, whom the Iowa Hawkeyes said, you know, we're going to kind of move on from you. You can leave if you'd like, even in our own conference. We'll even let you transfer in our own conference. That's how much they didn't want him there anymore. And Michigan won 10 games in year one with Jake Rudock, who was really shown the door at Iowa and is now making six figures as a backup quarterback in the National Football League. I mean, come on. Let's not be silly here. He's a great football coach. You want to tell me he's not as good as Jimbo Fisher and and um, Dabo Sweeney and Urban Meyer and Nick Saban? I'm okay with that. Those guys have all won conference titles and national championships. He's yet to do either. I'm okay with that. But this idea that he's overrated, that he's not a good football coach, don't conflate the fact you're sick of the Q factor with the fact the dude knows how to coach. They're two totally different things. J.D. Carlson, now a senior, is in to try a 20-yard field goal. He's three out of six between the 20 and the 30 this season. They go with a shovel pass. It goes to the goal line. It is. Not yet. It is Greg McThomas, and he did not score. They went for the gimmick, the trick play. They didn't score, but hold on. They may have a first down because they didn't. They could possibly have made a first down without scoring. The ball was just short of the 10-yard line. So let's see what happens when they stretch it out. Ohio State had their team on the field, but that wasn't the case. They did get the first down. (laughs) Well, they didn't get the touchdown. Here's a look at it, but Thomas is here. The snap's going to come back, and he's just going to get a little shovel pass right here, and he's going to have a guard pulling. Actually, that's the tight end that pulls around. Boy, that's tough. You stop him short of the goal line. I don't know. He may have even gotten in, but certainly a first down. Now we end this week's episode of Michigan Podcast with this shot. One of Florida's players was popping off a few weeks ago saying, hey, the disrespect is crazy. I can't wait till we beat the brakes off Michigan. I wasn't aware there was a bunch of disrespect about Florida's chances against Michigan. I think the Vegas has the game either a pick or Michigan a slight favorite. Um, I, I've seen uh, plenty of, of people pick Florida to win that football game. I, I get you need that no-respect card motivation. I mean, Michael Jordan used to play the no-respect card, okay? But whatever, dude. But your shot is one thing. This chaser from Chase Winovich, see what I did there? This chaser from Chase Winovich is better. We don't use brakes anyway. Foot is always on the gas. Now that, that's a good troll game right there. Hopefully, Chase Winovich plays as well as he trolls when we face the Gators on September the 2nd. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Michigan Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe here on YouTube. You can also check us out online at michiganpodcast.com. Follow us on Twitter at Michigan Podcast, Google Play, Stitcher, and iTunes as well. We will see you next week. Go Blue.